Hello, people. Hey, Ryan. How you doing, buddy? Hello, Miss White. How are you? Hey, I'm trying my new microphone and my new camera. Hey, Steph, yeah. can you do me a favor? Go to Facebook and see if you could hear me because I got the new microphone and camera on and I don't want to go through this whole thing. And Sure, Nick. Call me anytime tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mike, how are you? Hello, Miss Cheryl. Happy holidays to you, too. Yeah, it sounds okay. Yes. Do I sound professional? No. What do you mean, no? For real? You're fine. Does it sound better than it? it good. Okay. Do I sound a little sexier with the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Doug and Gina, thank you so much for the world's greatest beef jerky. Appreciate it so much. Miss Kay, thank you for the shirt wearing the shirt right now. Can't thank you enough. Hey, Carolyn, how are you? Hello, Drew. Hey, Lynn. I'll give people just a second here to jump on. Hey, Tom. Yeah, I enjoyed that, buddy. I didn't enjoy it late last night, but I enjoyed it while it took place. Uh, we have to do it a little more often. Boy, that was good. That was good. Nothing like a, a uh, good pork shoulder plate at Smoky Pig. Oof. Still one of my favorite meals ever anywhere. Good stuff. Good stuff. Merry Christmas to you too, Miss Carolyn. Hope you're doing well. I've been following your beautiful little granddaughter along the way. Hope everything's going well there. Mm -hmm. Laverne and Shirley are both here. That's a wonderful thing. I don't know if you guys saw, but Carmine uh, Ragusa just died recently. That was your sidekick. I'm so sorry. Hey, Sean, how you doing, buddy? How you doing? All right, so let's jump into it. We're on here long enough, right? So I'm going to go here. I just want to go to my page to remember. Okay, so earlier today, I made a post on Facebook. Um, something to the effect. This is for the average dog owners, guys. This, this really pertains to the everyday average dog owner, right? But unfortunately, there are a ton of dog trainers that do struggle a little bit with the simple communication process between the human and the dog. It's overlooked quite often, right? So the post had something to do with how it's really important that dogs understand the meaning of no. And unfortunately, most do not. They just don't. It's completely meaningless. To many dogs. Someone said, I think it might have been Mark, he said, uh, you know, most dogs think no is their middle name. 100%. 100%. That is so accurate. Think about how many times a person says no to their dog throughout the day and it has absolutely zero meaning, right? How do we teach that? Why is it that someone uses that word so often and it's so ineffective, right? There's so much, so much more to it that we can cover here, but we'll try to keep it really basic. So for you average dog owners out there that struggle with your dog, you have behavior problems, your dog doesn't do what you tell it to do. It doesn't stop jumping on you. It doesn't stop digging, right? And I have a question to go along with that from, from Malia here that we'll go over also. The problem is, guys, we talk about all the time. There has to be consequences in dog training, consequences for doing good and consequences for doing bad, right? Most people understand, even though they don't always use it correctly, they understand what a consequence for doing good is. It's usually just some form of reward, right? Whether it's a food treat, whether it's affection and praise, whether it's a toy, whatever. We understand the average dog owner loves, loves, loves to reward their dog for everything, usually too much. Most reward their dog just when it's not doing something wrong. And that, on the flip side, can lead to problems, right? 
really simple stuff. But when it comes to having a consequence for the word no or the no marker or a marker to indicate that the dog is doing something you don't like, that's where people fail. There's nothing there. And unfortunately for the dogs, the human believes that the dog understands what we're saying. And unless we've really taught them well, guys, they don't. They don't understand that, right? So someone said, someone asked, well, how do I teach the dog what no means? To I remove them from the situation I don't like and redirect them? No, that's not a consequence. It's really simple. What's a consequence for doing good? You say yes or you click and the reward, the reward is presented afterward, right? Not at the same time afterward. The reward follows. The yes marker or the reward marker marks the moment in time that the dog is doing exactly what you ask for or like, right? So you ask the dog to sit. The second the butt hits the ground, you mark it with a yes or a clicker or whatever you prefer. And then the reward follows. Everyone gets caught up on the timing of the reward when in reality, the timing of the markers is really, really important. Doesn't mean the reward can follow an hour later, right? But the timing of that reward is very important. It's the same thing on the no side of things. And we see this all the time. We see it all the time with all the people we work with at seminars, with all the clients, and just in everyday interaction with dog owners. We see it. No, no, no. And nothing follows. And they say no over and over and over. And there's absolutely no meaning to it. Someone on the Facebook post pointed out, or they use no as a question. 100%. They use a lot of things as a question. So instead of talking to the dog directly and clearly, they ask the question, no, no. These are problems, guys. These really muddy the waters for the dog and they make the communication so much more blurry than it has to be. And then the dog suffers the consequences, right? I never understood how people have issues with dogs jumping on them. Like that doesn't even register in my brain. Hey, Bob. Hello, Tim, AJ, Sarah. It doesn't even register in my brain. Like we've literally never had that it's not even a thing. So I don't know how people get there. Well, I kind of do know how they get there. The totality of everything you do within the confines of your home, the way you live with the dog, that's what creates the behavior, good or bad, right? And whether you like it or not, if you have a dog, you are a dog trainer. Whether you're a good or bad dog trainer is up to you. And whether you like it or not, if you are with your dog, you are training. The question is, are you training for good or are you training for bad? And these are facts that we can't ignore. We can't ignore. And if you think you can allow your relationship inside the home to be so weak that the dog doesn't follow instructions, in a confined area where it spends 99.99% of its time with no real world distractions. If you think you can allow the dog to blow you off or get away and do whatever it wants in that scenario. And then you think when you bring strangers into your home or you take your dog out into the real world, it's going to listen to you and it's going to listen to what no means you're out of your mind you're going to fail 100% of the time. Again, this is for the everyday average dog owner, right? That's where the big numbers are. Those are the people we have to touch a little closely. So how do we teach no means? The same way we teach what yes means. Yes or click, and then the good consequence follows. No, and then the consequence after whatever that is that you use. I don't care if that's spatial pressure. I don't care if that's a leash pop. I don't care if that's a tap on an e-collar or a pronger. It doesn't matter. It could be anything, right? It could be a touch from the hand, a touch from the leg. It doesn't matter. But there has to be something to indicate to that dog that no has meaning. And it cannot do what it just did because you don't approve of it. That's really important. So let's go to the, the question. It's not the question that got this started, but it all ties in, right? 
So, and I'll go through it quick. Malia asks, she has a 16-month old intact male boxer, has just moved from little boy status to being a little man and starting to leg hike and mark items outside. Wanting to postpone neuter till at least two years old. Smart, smart move. He's housebroken with no accidents, but she's concerned that we're reaching that stage where he will be more likely to start urine marking items in the home. Suggestions to avoid this behavior as it is difficult to undo once it begins. He's always in line of sight while unkenneled in the home, but dang, he's quick. Any suggestions on how to better keep him away from landscaping, young trees, etc. with urine marking? Now that behavior could be becoming more prominent. Just trying to be proactive with this concern before it becomes a full on behavior or bigger issue later. Okay, good question. Here's the thing, Malia. Um, just because your dog's starting to mature and he is, and he's intact and he's starting to lift his leg outside, that doesn't mean he's going to mark inside. With that being said, is there a possibility? Absolutely. What makes that possible? For one, everything we just talked about, if that dog does not respect that home as yours, your space, that he is borrowing and allowed to be part of, then they're going to do that, right? If there is confusion there on whose house that is, whose couch it is, whose bed it is, then you run a risk of having those situations. I have all intact dogs, males, all intact males, one intact female. I've never had a dog mark inside the home, never. Not a single time. Now, with that being said, and by the way, Bruno was lifting his leg at eight months old, and I've never seen that before. I've never seen a dog do that. Uh, not eight months, eight weeks old. He lifted his leg as soon as we took him home, right? Now, with that being said, Bruno is the only dog that almost did mark inside the home. This goes back to no. At seven months old, he had just turned seven months old. He was still, he was intact. We're standing in the kitchen, and I'll never forget it. He walked over to the corner of the kitchen cabinets and went to lift his leg right in front of me. He didn't think anything of it. It was just like a reflex. And the second he did that, I yelled no, and I moved in toward him hard. You know, and I made a big deal about it. Like, are you effing kidding me? Are you out of your mind? Go, get out of here. I took that space away from him. But the first thing that stopped him before he let anything out he knew what no meant. He knew what no meant. So the second he heard it, it's automatic. You stop what I'm doing. I didn't have to do anything physical to the dog at that moment. But he was already prepped and trained to understand what no means. Now, for our dogs, me, my wife, and my kids, there doesn't ever have to be much physical correction because we train the dog. And we don't allow too much freedom before the dog can handle it, right? We don't put the dog in circumstances that they can't handle and they're sure to get in trouble when they're puppies. That would be unfair. One of the biggest issues we have with dogs is people give them way too much freedom before they're capable of having that responsibility. And when you do that, it's no, 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 no all the time. No Rex, no Rex, no Fido, no, 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 no. The no becomes completely meaningless. The dog's name com becomes completely meaningless. And that's why it's so important to allow the freedom of the dog as the dog can handle that responsibility, right? Because, and I just saw someone mention this earlier today, you have two options. You could provide a lot of management up front when the puppy is young and start giving freedom as the dog can handle it and then give the dog a lot of freedom the rest of its life at a very young age. Or you can give the puppy a lot of freedom in the beginning and what will happen is you're going to have to manage that dog the rest of its life because you're going to create a lot of bad habits. You're going to create a lot of bad habits and no is be going to become meaningless, right? So now let's talk about those consequences for no, the different types of consequences, the different types of the level of consequences. Right away, a lot of people 
whenever you hear about corrections or punishment, they always think bad, something bad, like something really hard on the dog. That's not the case, you know, not the case, not even close. And if you have to do that, and if you have to do that frequently, then you're doing something wrong along the way. So the one good thing that Malia said, she said a few good things, but the one thing she said was, I asked her, is the dog ever unsupervised outside? She said, no. Well, that's a good thing. That makes it real easy now. Now, let's say she's at a distance and she has a certain amount of trees, certain trees that she doesn't want the dog to pee on, right? Well, how do we create that boundary without putting a fence around those trees? Again, the communication has to be there, right? How well does the dog know the word no? What can we do? What are the different options? What are the different tools? What kind of training can we, we elicit there? Of course, when someone's talking about a dog away from them off leash, most are going to say there's only one way you can communicate that to that dog off leash when it's away from you, and that's with an e-collar. And that's, that's kind of true, but not always true, right? Not everyone has to turn to an e-collar for that. Is that the easiest, quickest, most effective, and, and least aversive way for the dog? It is. It is. Most people don't understand that because they don't understand how it can be used, right? So you have a couple of options here. Let's just use you have, a, a, you have one tree, Malia, that you don't want this dog to pee on. We'll give you a couple of different options, right? A couple of different ways because not one thing is right for your situation or dog. So let's say now your dog understands no because we retrain it and the dog understands what no means for real, not what most people think. Now, let's say you're outside and your dog is getting ready to go pee on, on the tree and he goes to lift his leg and you say no and the dog pees anyway. You're 50 feet away from the dog. What are your options at that moment, right? Because many are going to tell you is it's too late. The dog already peed. That's not true. That's not true. There has to be punishment for that if the dog just did something that you told him not to, right? Now, to be super fair to the dog, again, does the dog know what no means? Usually it don't. So let's say it does or let's say it doesn't. It doesn't matter. What's the proper way to deal with that? Let's say you don't have an e-collar on the dog, right? You're 50 feet away from the dog. The go, dog goes to hike its leg. You say, no, it doesn't anyway. Now it's your time. You have to close that ground and go to the dog. You have to go to the dog. Now, when you get to the dog, that's where some type of aversive is used. If there's a leash, it's a firm leash pop. If there's just a collar on, you could pop the collar. You could just poke the dog out of the way, go get out of here. But you have, you have to go. Your demeanor and your attitude, how you go at that dog, is, has to have meaning so the dog understands what no just meant, right? So if you just say no and then just walk over there normally and do nothing and say, come on, let's go, redirect the dog, pull it away, you get nothing in cross, right? There has to be a no and then you have to close that ground using that spatial pressure. Your demeanor, your body language, your intent has to have meaning behind it. And then there should be some type of aversive implemented when you're there, right? Now, let's say you do have an e-collar on the dog because you say you're, you're, you're e and we're going to go deeper into this. You say you're e-collar training your dog and, and we're going to go about your next statement on that. So let's say you do have an e-collar on your dog now. Now you have two different options. You have to decide, do you want the aversive associated with you or do you want to create a suspicious behavior around the trees? You could do it either way. I'll give you the option. Normally for things like chewing the bushes, peeing on the bushes, digging, counter surfing, usually I like to create a suspicious behavior out of that where it's not associated with you. So there is no verbal no or anything. And it's even better if you're not on the scene. So since you are e-collar training the dog, what's the best way to create that suspicion around the trees? 
you're inside watching out a window, you have the e-collar set on the appropriate level. And the second the dogs go over to the tree and the leg goes up, that's where you're implementing the aversive at an appropriate level to stop the behavior for good. Okay. On the flip side, if you want it associated with you, it's the same thing. You're outside. No, you implement the aversive with the e-collar the second the leg goes up. All right. But I prefer to create that suspicious behavior without it being associated to me. Now, this is what you said next, Malia, where I think I said that's the wrong approach and it's never going to work. So let me read it for the people here. OK. Um, mm, mm, mm. OK. All right. OK. So here you said never alone outside, even though the artist fence has e-collar and beginning the conditioning with recalls and associating the no with immediate redirection. I'm not sure what that means. We don't want to redirect with no. We want to stop the behavior, okay? Redirection and sensation on lowest perceivable setting when caught in the act of something undesirable, such as digging. 100% incorrect way to do that, Malia. And that will never stop the behavior. Let's say digging or peeing on the bush or jumping on your counter. And here's why. Your intentions are in the right place. No doubt about it. Totally get it. So you're concerned with misusing the e-collar. Totally get it. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. So although we start training at those very lowest level perceived levels by the dog in that conditioning phase, that is a very short period of time that we are staying there. Very short period of time. So that short period of time for me is a couple of quick sessions, one or two days before we move into that intermittent phase. I won't get into all that now where we're introducing the dog to different concepts, different distractions, different durations, where we start to teach the dog to respond, whether it has an e-collar on or not. Right. But to stop a behavior, to stop a behavior for good. If you're using the lowest levels perceived on an e-collar, the behavior will never stop, will never stop. And here's why. Yes, we start with the lowest levels. And the way I teach it, my goal for everyone is that we teach it in a way that you will rarely ever have to use the e-collar. If you do, it will be effective and you will not mess your dog up. So again, everything I've done on that subject, it's for the average dog owner and to stop the average dog owner and inexperienced trainer from lighting their dogs up and frying them with the e-collar. And with that word frying, you can't burn your dog or physically harm them with an e-collar. Just so you know, you can cause great mental stress and anguish on a dog. And I've seen it too many times that I like to mention, right? The problem with trying to stop a behavior like that, Malia, digging, peeing on the trees, whatever it is, if you start at the lowest levels, you're just stopping that behavior at that moment, right? That's all you're doing. It's just negative reinforcement. The dog learns how to turn it off. What's going to happen is the dog's going to keep going back to the behavior and you're going to have to keep elevating the levels of correction. This goes for not just the e-collar, but any type of tool, a flat collar, a prong collar, doesn't matter. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have to keep elevating the level of aversive and the dog is going to keep doing the behavior. And what happens then is the dog starts to adapt to the higher level aversives very quickly and will be able to ignore the highest level of aversives because you've just prepared the dog for that. Something I've been talking about for years that I've learned from someone else. And that was one of the best pieces of information I've ever received. Right? So your heart's in the right place. And that's what most people do. Oh, I only use the e-collar on low levels. That's not correct. That's not correct. I know many believe that I won't use it to stop a behavior. That's not true. The fact is I just rarely have to because of the training I put into the dog, not the e-collar, right? I have the success 
with the tool because of what I do with the dog. I don't have the success with the dog because of the tool. There's a big difference. And so many rely 100% on the e-collar. That's a problem. What's the level of education with the dog and the handler? That's the most important things, right? Um, with dogs with higher tolerance, do you start at a higher level? It all depends, Nick, when we're talking about punishment. So the correct thing there to do, Malia, if you want to stop digging, then the aversive has to be high enough to have true meaning to the dog to stop that behavior one or two times. That's it. Because here's what happens. If you do that very quickly, you could start. Sorry. Ooh, sorry. You could start going down in levels. OK, now a lot of people say I read your book and then they say what they're doing. And that's not what I'm doing. So go in my book, read the chapter about Jesse, the dog that was found living on the highway. The people were adopting it, but they had cats and Jesse was pretty much eating cats and had very high prey drive. I explain there step for step what I did. And at no time did I ever, ever talk about correcting him on low levels from chasing and going after cats. Okay. As a matter of fact, it was the opposite. Right to the top, I went with him. Because this is a matter of you have to stop this behavior now or these people can't take you. And this is a behavior that can get you killed. We can't do it. So I only had to go really high on him one time. One time. And then the second time was a very mild, medium level discomfort, right? And then after that, I never had to do that again. Never. So that is vital. That is so, so important that people understand that. But again, it goes into that basic communication that people don't understand and where we're failing the dogs. The dog doesn't know what no means. His name means nothing to him. And we're not being very direct when we want the dog to stop a behavior, right? So like like the, like I, I talked about earlier, the jumping thing. I, I just, I can't fathom not being able to dog to jump on you. And I never have to really use an aversive to do it, to do that. They just don't do it. A lot of people, the dog jumps and then they ask the dog to sit and they pet the dog. Oh, I made him sit first. Well, the dog still put himself there and he just jumped on you. He still got what he wanted. That's not good, right? And the second the dog jumped, what did you do? You took a step back. Now, we talk about the use of space all the time. Now, you just allow that dog to take that space. That dog's already in charge. He already won. He's already punked you, right? When in reality, if you say no and you move into the dog hard, go. You push the dog off you. You hold his paws, right? Now you can't go. Now you can't leave. Think of one of the greatest scenes in movie history, The Bronx Tale, right? Remember A Bronx Tale? One of my all-time favorite movies and scenes. The bikers, the biker gang goes into Sonny's bar, right? They're known to cause trouble. They sit down while they start causing trouble. After Sonny asked them to leave, he asked them to leave. They said no. They started causing trouble. Now Sonny walks over to the door best scene ever. And he locks the door. He said, now you can't leave. And they're like, oh boy, this ain't good. And then shit breaks loose, right? Now the dog jumps up on you. You said, no, now you grab that dog. You got his collar, you got his paws, right? This is just one way. And I don't have to do this. I never do this. But now the dog's trying to get away. Oh, no, no, no. No, now you can't get off of me. Now you can't get off of me. Now you're going to stay here. And the dog's like, screw this right? I never have to do that. But for the average person, that would be better than doing nothing or turning your back or giving the dog a treat or asking the dog to sit. None of that stuff is good stuff. None of that stuff is good stuff. The communication has to be there. If you have issues with your dog in the home, your dog should have a leash on. Having a leash on your dog inside the home can change your dog's life for the better very quickly, very quickly. OK, now you think it's OK for your dog to jump on you, but then you get pissed when he jumps on grandma. Can't do that. You can't do that. It's not fair to the dog. Right. You have to set the boundaries 
within your family that you want that dog to follow around everyone. That's the education the dog needs. So let's say you have very minimal dog ability, dog training skills, and grandma does come over and you have a leash on your dog and the dog goes to jump on grandma. What do you do? The dog should know the word no. Hey, Tony, right? No. And then a really good firm leash pop. Now you go get out of here. I don't want my dog staying on a place when people come to the door and building frustration. And then you say, okay. And the dog goes crazy and running around the house. That's not effective. It's not effective. I want the dogs to be able to go to the door to me. But again, it all ties in to that simple, basic communication, yes and no. There has to be consequences for both, right? If your dog is used to a clicker, click, feed, click, feed, click, feed, click, feed, right? That thing becomes so reflexive to the dog. I showed a video of Dante when he's 12 weeks old, 12 weeks old, and I don't use a lot of clickers. And I showed the video of him running down the driveway full speed, and I clicked. What did he do? Hit the brakes, came flying back. It's reflexive. He can't help it. Now, if I click and nothing, click and nothing, click and nothing, now I keep clicking and there's no more food, no reward following. Guess what happens? That clicker becomes useless. We completely take away its power because nothing good followed. But yet people will say no over and over and over and nothing follows. If you say no and nothing follows, it's useless. Your dog doesn't understand it. There has to be meaning behind it, okay? So all of that is very, very important. And it's basic, it's basic, it's basic. And this is stuff that most, I say most dog trainers know because all don't all don't, right? The timing of that communication is key. Has to be no, and then the consequence follows. It's yes, and the consequence follows. There has to be. And if you're doing it right, guys, you very rarely have to use any type of aversive with your dogs. We don't. I don't. My wife doesn't. My kids don't. Because they listen to what we say. What the words that come out of our mouth makes sense to them because we prepared them. Dante's not in the house running around with the other dogs. He's a year old. He can't handle it. He can't handle it. He's going to want to play with the dogs nonstop and create chaos. It's not fair to him to leave him out like the other dogs. He's not ready for that yet. He could handle a lot more now than he could at 12 weeks old, at 20 weeks old. But I give it to him. And when I see this is too much for him, then the leash goes on. You're with me or you go in the crate. This way, he could be a self-sufficient dog like the rest of my dogs and every dog we've ever owned. That's my goal. For me, two years to train a dog from puppy to two years old. It's all training. If you want a self-sufficient dog with no behavioral problems, you have to put in the work for those two years, especially that first year. It's work. It's work. Thank you, Linda. That's very nice of you. How's my new microphone? I hope I sound better. I know it can't make me look better, but I got a new camera too, so I'm trying. The problem is when I upload these videos to YouTube, they look awful when you take them off Facebook or the computer. What's up, Daniel? So if anyone knows how to make that better, putting on YouTube, please let me know. So I hope that makes sense, Malia. OK, just because he's raising his leg outside doesn't mean he should. And here's another thing, guys. When we think of inside our home, we think of everything within our walls. You're upstairs, you're downstairs. Most often, if someone tells me their dogs never peed or pooped in the house and all of a sudden they start having accidents here or there, I'll always ask them. And it's almost always the answer. I'll say, let me ask you something. Are they doing it in like a spare room or, a, you know, spare bedroom or a room that you guys don't use? And almost always it's yes, they are. Here's why, guys. To us, everything under the roof is our home, right? We expect the dog to follow the rules and not do those things. But in reality, in the dog's eyes, in the dog world, 
Hey, Victor. What's up, Jake? Thank you, brother. Devante, how are you, pal? Um, in the dog's eyes, the inside of the home is everywhere we spend time. And the dog spends time. And we have our scent and the dog scent. Places we spend a good about of time and the dog wanders. The problem is some people have homes that have bedrooms or spare rooms or offices that no one ever goes in, right? You don't hang out in there. No one goes in there. You might get a guest once or twice a year and they'll sleep in there. When the dog goes in there, that's new turf. To the dog, that's not your house. And that's why a lot of times even a really well-trained dog that doesn't have accidents will pee or poop in that room. To the dog, that's not your house. Something brand new. No different than a new place outside to dogs. So always think, your dog's not always trying to be a deviant, right? That's just natural dog language. Oh, this room, whew, I smell nothing in here. I don't smell mom's feet, dad's feet. I don't smell their clothes. No one's been laying here. Oh, I've never been in here. I've never been in here, right? I'm going to go ahead and, and claim this as my space. Since dad, it doesn't belong to dad. It doesn't belong to mom. Right. I'm going to just go ahead and drop a nice deuce right here. I'm going to just go ahead and pee right here. They won't mind because it's not inside. Right. Because when we go outside to new places, they don't mind if I pee and poop. Think about how the dog sees it, guys. So if you have a client and you're dealing with something like that and all of a sudden you get that, that's what it usually is. A room no one ever goes in. Brand new place for the dog. OK, so I hope that. Touch, I don't want to stay too long on here. Um, I, I'm really trying to be better about answering people's questions, especially when if, if I get 200 of the same question, I'm trying to be better about this stuff and not being away from here so much. Um, you guys support me. I should support you back. It, it, it's that simple, right? But I hope that helps, Malia, especially with the e-collar and the low-level stuff and how to... Listen, take it a step further. You don't want him around a certain perimeter, right, Malia? How does an underground fence work? They start the training with flags, right? And when the dog goes to those flags, they get some kind of a tone, they get a warning, and then boom, high-level correction. Well, those flags become very, very obvious to the dog. You could do the same thing with your trees there. You could put some kind of markers. You don't have to give a tone or anything, right? You could put a visual aid. And when the dog gets to a certain point that you don't want him to go past, that's where the aversive comes. And it's uh, it's very, very, very quick. And guess what? If you ever watch a dog, I don't like underground fences, right? Because they don't keep dogs and animals out and stuff. And I don't like, I don't leave my dogs outside unattended, even in a fence yard. But you never see a dog walking around a yard with an underground fence scared. Oh, my God. When's it going to happen? You know why? Because it's very clear where it happens. Oh, that shit over there, those orange flags, screw that. I ain't going over there because every time I go over there, this shit hurts. I don't like it. So I'm just going to stay out of there, right? So the only place they have that suspicious behavior is right around that boundary that you set. So you could set that boundary however you want, and it's very easy, and it will be very effective at keeping your dog away from that stuff, okay? So I hope that helps, guys. I hope that helps very much. Um, let's see. Devante, I'll look at some questions. I have a three-year-old German show that's 100% off leash trains thanks to your videos and proper use and conditioning of the ECA. Hey, brother, that makes me very happy. Thanks for saying that, Devante. It mean, means the world means the world okay Ooh, let's see what jill said here what did i just do uh show australian chef will be four years march 18th i have tried every collar except e-collar she wants to lunge and chase every car fedex on walks and barks at them she will hear them blocks away and waits and freaks she even does it in the house and will freak when they go by in front of the house. I'm at my and an e-collar won't have help that, Jill. There has to be training. Right. And that's not something I could tell you. Hey, just do, that's an easy fix. I mean, that's a that's a super, super easy fix. But you have to have someone 
that knows what they're doing, right? Because there's a big difference between stopping, stopping a behavior temporarily with negative reinforcement and stopping a, a behavior like that permanently with punishment. There's a huge difference. And most people don't understand that concept. So you have to find someone in your area that knows how to deal with that. And if they want to put an e-collar on your dog and just stop it with that, don't hire them because it's not going to work. I promise you. I promise you. Um, hey, Deanna. Thank you for your help last weekend. Been working on the yes and no and leash pressure. Well done, Deanna. So glad to hear it. So glad to hear it. In Indiana, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, I know, I, I'm sure I do. Jill, I just can't think right now. It's been a long day. We went we went to Nashville. My wife dragged me to the mall to do Christmas shopping. I can't shop with her. Like she just, her stamina is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I see you. I, they see you too with your wine in your hand. Like that girl can shop, let me tell you. Our kids' college fund is probably gone. You know, it's she's got stamina in there. I can't do it. I can't do it. So can I leave it on but not turned on? It's his heat collar. What does that mean, Michelle? Uh, hey, Maria. Have you ever heard of Modern Icon? Just got one of the coolest collars. From the Michelle, what does that mean? So can I leave it on but not turned on? It's his heat collar. What, what, well, that depends. Uh, that's it's kind of, It can't help you if it's not turned on, right? But I don't know. Uh... I must have missed a question. Hey, Matthew, how you doing, buddy? Uh, oh, yeah, I hear Dante whining. It's feeding time. Oh, God, that dog. I swear. Unbelievable. All right, guys, I'm going to get going. I don't want to keep these too long. 43 minutes, that's long enough of me babbling. But I hope that helps a little bit. And, and remember, guys. There's going to be people who watch this that just want to criticize everything. They know everything and they don't understand why we'd be talking about something so basic, right? Well, guess what? Millions and millions of dog owners out there, this isn't basic to them. And they don't understand this stuff and they struggle. And that's how we're, who we're trying to help. Because if we could help the everyday dog owner, these are the people that are losing their dogs to the shelters because of behavioral problems. So if you truly care about dogs, we have to do better about teaching people the truth about purely positive training and balance training and tools and everything in between, right? I was gonna go a little deeper on the peeing stuff using a clicker and positive reinforcement, but I didn't want like to go, Phew. I didn't want it to get so far blown, but, but it is something that is very doable, right? Very, very doable, but you're not going to be able to do it because it takes a lot of experience, but yes, it can be done. It absolutely can be done. And I've done it and I've done it with aggression. I've done it with a lot of things with a clicker and food. A lot of people won't understand that the people at some of the seminars that have seen it, they understand what I'm talking about, but we won't go any deeper. All right. Hey guys, it's Saturday, right? Saturday, Saturday night. Thank you for spending your time here. I uh, appreciate you guys very much. Next week is Christmas guys. I hope everyone has a really great week and a great holiday. Okay. And uh, if there's anyone struggling out there in any way, hit me up, give me a holler. All right, guys. Thank you. Peace.